This episode contains some brief discussion of suicide, so it may not be suitable for all listeners. Before we get to Canada, we need to start this story in the Malaysian jungle. I grew up in the rainforest as a young person. I never have gone to the urban or small town until I was 11 years old. The rainforest that was Mutangarud's home was in Borneo, the largest island in the Malay archipelago. The country they lived in was Malaysia, but his people, the Penang, lived quite independently from the state, relying on the forest to provide for them. We have been hunting, fishing, and getting our material economic product, as it were, from the forest alone. And that's how life was for the Penang. I thought that was a wonderful time. And then in the 70s, while we were doing the farming, we heard that surveyors were coming in from down the river. They told the Penang that they were simply doing a survey, nothing to worry about. But it wasn't long until the bulldozers came. The government was surveying the land so that they could cut down the rainforest, the same forest that provided Urud's people with their livelihood. Bit by bit, they cut the trees down. Though the Penang are indigenous to the region, the government did not recognize their title to the land. Mutang grew up and went off to college downriver to get himself an education. In the meantime, his people began to fight back against the destruction of their forest. I realized that our community were being pushed around as they tried to protest this logging uh, incursion into the the territory. I said, well, I am educated. I am from there. I grew up in the area. So I feel so connected to the land, to the forest. And so I offered myself to assist them in writing letters of petitions to the government. But the government didn't address their concerns. The timber was far too valuable environmental and indigenous activists began to be arrested by the Malaysian authorities. For many years when I was doing this activism, I always noticed that the police were always after me. I always see them everywhere I was around. It was clear their strategy wasn't working. So they took their case abroad. With the support of a Canadian environmental NGO, Mutang did a world tour, trying to get the global community to pay attention to the destruction of the rainforest in his home. He met with future U.S. Vice President Al Gore. He traveled to Rio de Janeiro for the first Earth Summit. He even addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations. For defending our way of life, we have been called greenies, pirates, terrorists, and traitors. Our lives are threatened by company goons. Our women are being raped by loggers who invade our villages. While the companies get rich from our forests, We are condemned to live in poverty and eventual genocide. And when I came back after two months, there was a big repercussion and the chief minister called me a liar and not faithful to the government. The chief minister of Mutang's home state, which is called Sarawak, was a man by the name of Abdul Taib Mahmoud. Taib is a man known for his pugnacious rhetoric and extravagant tastes, driving luxury cars and wearing large pieces of ornate jewelry. He portrays himself as a man of the people, the literal embodiment of the Sarawakan state. Some people call him the last white Raja, a reference to his gleaming white hair, as well as to the British family that ruled Sarawak as their personal monarchy for a century. Abdul Taib Mahmoud, was the most powerful man in Sarawak for decades. And clear-cutting the rainforest to sell timber was one of his main priorities. There is no development without leadership. There is no development without forward vision because it is just like sailing into the sea without a map. But even Taib couldn't stop Mutang Arud from fighting. And uh, in the end, when there was no body listening to us for two or three years, we, you know, we were looking at Canada, we were looking at Australia, we were looking at New Zealand, where indigenous communities were blockading roads because of incursion into their land. 
In fact, it was a Canadian protest, one we talked about on this season previously, that was his main inspiration. Uh, one of the most poignant located in Canada that I, I remember that I went around the community and for two months to tell them about was the Oka uh, crisis in, in uh, Montreal. Mutang helped organize blockades of logging roads in his home state of Sarawak. Sven Robinson, the Canadian NDP MP, even traveled all the way to Malaysia to witness it. But the authorities moved in against him. Mutang was arrested and held in solitary confinement for his participation in the blockades. It was frightening to be in a solitary confinement for four weeks, but I think I was the least long period in a solitary confinement. But it was frightening. I've never been frightened in my life in, in that way because you are blindfolded. You know, you are uh, put into a small cell of five by eight and you uh, there's no light, hardly any light coming in. And you're fed through the window, a small window at the door and uh, you're surrounded by all these insects and uh, ants and spiders that are trying to eat your food. Mutang was released on bail. And with the help of friends, he was able to sneak across the border to Brunei. And from there, he got on a plane to Vancouver as an asylum seeker. For 20 years, Mutang lived as an exile from his homeland. He continued his activism, but also worked with indigenous communities here. And for a long time, Canada was the place that took Mutang in, the place where activists had helped bring global attention to the plight of his people. But it wasn't until years later that he began to hear a different kind of story. Mutang wasn't the only person from Sarawak who had moved to Canada. So did the daughter of Abdul Taib Mahmoud, the chief minister of Sarawak, the man in power during the destruction of the rainforest. Jamila Taib was an extremely wealthy real estate developer living in Ottawa. In the early 2010s, journalists and NGOs began to allege that Abdul Taib Mahmoud was personally benefiting from the clear-cutting of the rainforest to the tune of billions of dollars, and that some of it was ending up in Canadian real estate. Only recently I realized that, wow, there is a connection to Canada with all this money that is being made in Sarawak from the timber and from the rainforest of Borneo. The destruction of Borneo's rainforest has been called the worst environmental crime of our times. And if Abdul Taib Mahmoud was indeed making billions from it, it would constitute one of the worst cases of corruption in the world. The deforestation of Sarawak is not just a threat to Borneo's indigenous peoples. In the era of climate crisis, it's a global catastrophe. And at the heart of the scandal is Abdul Taib Mahmoud. He has been the most powerful man in the state. And some say that he's also now become the richest. But those same accusers claim that the last white Raja's empire isn't limited to Sarawak. They argue that its tendrils extend deep into Canada. I'm Arshi Mann, and from Canada Land, this is Commons. Borneo, which Sarawak forms part of, is arguably the most biodiverse corner of the planet. It's the third largest tropical rainforest in the world. And so its value in terms of natural heritage is unparalleled. That's Claire Rucastle brown She's a longtime investigative journalist and the founder of Sarawak Report, an online news outlet, as well as Radio Free Sarawak, an independent radio station. And really until the late 70s, it had been by and large preserved as an absolute gem of our natural world, full of information, scientific value, and staggering beauty and excitement, a wonderful place to go to. Claire Rucastle brown was born in Sarawak when it was still a British colony, and she spent the first eight years of her life there. I remember being up trees quite a lot of my time. There weren't many other entertainments in that part of the world. It was a really beautiful, beautiful, natural place to be brought up. 
And I, I also remember vividly departing actually from Sarawak and flying out of the country, down the coastline, looking out of the plane window at the most glorious canopy from above. After leaving Malaysia, Claire grew up in the United Kingdom. She spent her career working as an investigative reporter, and in 2006, she was invited to attend a conference in Sarawak. So after nearly 40 years, she returned to the place of her birth. I looked down on just a, an unlimited expanse of oil palm plantation, a monoculture, just utter destruction. That was a, a horrific contrast for me. She had closely followed the environmental devastation that had been wrought on the rainforest. But seeing it up close was something different. The consequences of that on the indigenous peoples who lived there was devastating. So this wasn't just an environmental tragedy. It was a human tragedy of untold proportions. Everything was being wiped out. And there were some communities were, were starving as a result of having their jungle cut from under them, their rivers polluted, no longer providing them with the fish that they had lived from, animals, species being wiped out. It really was the most appalling situation. When she took her trip to Malaysia, Claire was moving into freelancing, so she decided to focus on the crisis in Sarawak. Well, look, the reason I started talking about it was because I knew the local Sarawak journalists couldn't. I mean, quite a number of them had collared me while I was there originally and said, you know, this is the situation. We can't write about it. Within a few years, Claire was operating a news website and a radio station both focused on Sarawak. The backlash was swift and severe. I was very rapidly banished from Sarawak for covering some of the blockades by the natives who were desperately, sadly, trying to prevent loggers coming into their remaining hunting lands and their native lands and so forth. So I immediately became an enemy of the state. The chief minister, Abdul Tai Mahmood, singled her out and publicly denounced her. He stood up in the parliament building that his own company, of course, had been commissioned expensively to build and denounced me as an enemy of the state of Sarawak, someone who was a, a danger to the country and accused me of having some nefarious agenda. Abdul Taib Mahmood held power in Sarawak for an extraordinary 35-year stretch. Abdul Taib Mahmood likes to present himself as a very clever fellow. There's nothing that flatters him better than the uh, sycophantic description of him as the, the CEO of Sarawak. You know, he's not just a politician, he's a brilliant businessman. He loves all that. I have a slightly less enamoured opinion of him. Throughout his many years as chief minister of Sarawak, Abdul Taib Mahmood became well known for his lavish tastes. Taib had fabulous grounds that he lived in. He swanned around in jets. He had fleets. He was famous for his fleets of Rolls Royces that he kept in his basement garage in Sarawak. And he had jewellery dripping off him. All his, the women in his family were sort of walked around draped in outrageous, ostentatious, garish jewellery. To really understand this man, I need to give you a quick history lesson. Abdul Taib Mahmood was born in 1936, at a time when Sarawak was an independent kingdom ruled by a European family who had purchased the land from the Sultan of Brunei over a hundred years before. Japan invaded during World War II in order to get access to the state's valuable oil fields, and after the Japanese Empire was defeated, Sarawak became a British protectorate. While Sarawak was still under British rule, a young Abdul Taib Mahmood went to Australia to pursue his education. He eventually got a law degree from Adelaide University. And uh, having achieved that, and actually having uh, met his wife of the time at Adelaide University, he and his wife returned to Sarawak and immediately went into politics. He returned in 1962, a year before Sarawak would join the Malaysian Federation. Abdul Taib's uncle was an MP in Malaysia's first parliament and quickly became a cabinet minister. And young Abdul Taib benefited greatly from his uncle's position. By 1963, he himself was a cabinet minister in Sarawak. But it needs to be borne in mind that he has always been a salary man, a salary man of the state. So we know how much his salary was. It um, was always a modest salary. 
In the 1970s, a political crisis propelled his uncle to become the chief minister of Sarawak with the help of his allies in the federal Malaysian government. And in exchange, Claire says that Taib's uncle made an agreement. So he did a deal whereby the central government was given the right to all the wealth of Sarawak's oil fields. And in return, the central government basically allowed Tun Yaakob and then his nephew to, I'll use the word pillage because that's what they did. They had free reign to run and profit from the remaining natural resources of Sarawak. In 1981, Abdul Taib Mahmood succeeded his uncle as chief minister of Sarawak, and he quickly began to take control over as many levers of power as he could. Malaysia has a term that's used that I've, I've taken me a while to fully understand the significance of the term, but it's, it's money politics. And, you know, there are enormous natural wealth and resources, and, you know, that, that is distributed uh, by the likes of Taib to ensure that he could buy elections, he could buy political support, and he could basically steamroller anyone who didn't have access to that wealth. You know, they, they, just impossible to stand up to the power of that wealth when it came to controlling the state. So Ty basically did what he liked. He placed himself in every decision-making position that was significant in the state. He made himself chief minister. He was planning an environment minister, finance minister, all rolled into one. Ty promised the people of Sarawak that he would bring development and wealth to the state. Mutangor Rood remembers that the message spoke to him as a young man. And so when Ty came in, we were, you know, I was, I was personally attracted to him because he was, uh, in a way, trying to uh, bring development into Sarawak. Sarawak became one of Malaysia's wealthiest states by GDP. But that wealth was highly unevenly distributed. And Taib's rule quickly began to have devastating consequences for Sarawak's indigenous people. His government created a land custody and development board, which was used to confiscate the customary lands of the state's indigenous tribes. He was, of course, the chairman of that uh, authority, and uh, he then parceled out those lands to whomsoever he pleased. Abdul Taib Mahmood was also the head of the Land and Surveys Commission, which controlled the timber and palm plantation licenses. And Taib, through his political party, was able to deliver seats in federal elections to the coalition that has ruled Malaysia almost uninterrupted since independence. So he became an important power broker in the country at large. Abdul Taib Mahmood's reign in Sarawak would lead to environmental destruction on a grand scale. And as that happened, the people around him, his family and allies, became immensely wealthy. When Claire Rucastle Brown began to report on Sarawak, she did what most good journalists do. She followed the money. So when I started to, as a journalist, approach this situation, you know, I'd made a decision that I was going to start at the ground and I was going to look into this man who was famous throughout uh, Sarawak and indeed Malaysia and beyond as an ostentatiously wealthy man. But remember... Abdul Taib Mahmood had spent the entirety of his career as a public servant in Malaysia. He had no reason to be so. If he had abided by the rules of his job, which was that he should not engage in business, naturally, while being an elected officer of the state and, and paid salary as a public servant. Though he lived a lavish life on paper, Abdul Taib Mahmood's assets were meager. But that wasn't the case for his siblings, cousins, and children. The Bruno Manser Fund, a Swiss environmental NGO, estimated in 2012 that 20 members of the Taib family together had around $20 billion. That would rank them as one of the wealthiest families in Asia. A leaked U.S. State Department cable from 2006 stated that, quote, embassy sources outside the government uniformly characterize him as highly corrupt, and that, quote, Taib and his relatives are widely thought to extract a percentage from most commercial contracts, including those for logging, awarded in the state. Abdul Taib has denied that any of their wealth stems from corruption. 
And though Taib has been investigated by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, he has never been charged by Malaysian authorities. And as we criticized the wealth of his children, he would then start to sort of allege that they were sort of brilliant geniuses in business. You know, from from their late teens, his children just happened to be brilliant, naturally, because they were his children. The same goes for his siblings and cousins. He is denied that he has ever had a hand in making them rich. So how did Abdul Taib Mahmoud's family get so rich? One representative example would be to look at the case of Kaya Mata Sarawak, the largest company in the state. The company was founded in the 1970s as a government-owned cement manufacturer. But Abdul Taib Mahmoud decided to change that. When he became chief minister, like many sort of uh, young countries, a, a lot of the assets of the state were controlled by the state, were owned by the state. And what Thai decided was that, uh, you know, it was of high time that in a Thatcherite fashion, they were privatized. So companies that had been owned by the state, concessions that had been, you know, run by the state, suddenly ended up consolidated mainly in one particular company called CMS. When CMS became privatized, a large portion of shares ended up in the hands of Taib's family members. But particularly in the early years, the vast majority of the shares were owned by his wife, who um, had left Poland and arrived in Australia uh, without a penny, and then married Taib at an early age, and his, uh, his children and various siblings and cousins. The Sarawak Constitution states that the chief minister shall not, quote, hold any office of profit and shall not engage in any commercial enterprise. But that rule doesn't apply to the chief minister's wife. According to a report from the Bruno Manser Fund, between 1993 and 2013, Kaya Mata Sarawak received almost $1.5 billion in contracts from the state of Sarawak. And that same report states that most of those didn't go through a public tendering process. And Taib's family members held many key positions in the company. Own Mahmoud, Abdul Taib Mahmoud's brother, was the group chairman for years. He was succeeded by one of Taib's sons, Suleiman. Another Taib's son and a son-in-law also served on the board. Other family members were senior management. According to a Bloomberg report, Locals in Sarawak joked that CMS actually stood for Chief Minister and Sons. But Claire Rucastle-Brown says that CMS was just one of many companies, partially or wholly owned by the Taib family, that benefited from state contracts. Since Abdul Taib Mahmoud came to power, timber has been one of the biggest industries in Sarawak. The hardwoods from the rainforest are immensely valuable around the world for products such as luxury furniture. And after the trees are cut down, palm monocultures are planted so that companies can manufacture palm oil. Claire says that Abdul Taib Mahmoud himself controlled who got the licenses for both timber and palm. And according to Claire, those licenses often ended up in the hands of companies controlled by the Taib family or political allies of Abdul Taib Mahmoud. So what you would see is the public purse providing the investment and his own family companies reaping the benefits of that investment. It was all pretty blatant. And really anyone in the loop knew exactly what was going on for many years. The wealth of various members of Abdul Taib Mahmoud's family is a matter of public record. But critics like Claire Rucastle Brown and the Bruno Manser Fund take this a step further. They argue that Abdul Taib Mahmoud himself is the ultimate financial beneficiary of many of these companies. In 2013, Global Witness, an NGO that focuses on corruption and human rights abuses, conducted an undercover investigation in Sarawak. They sent in someone to pose as a Western businessman who wanted to buy land and get a concession to start a palm plantation. Although we approached the government directly, officials sent us to members of Taib's own family. One area of land offered to Global Witness was owned by a company called Ample Agro. The company belongs to Taib's first cousins, the Abdul Rahman sisters, daughters of Sarawak's previous chief minister. 
Here's one of Taib's cousins, Fatima Abdul Rahman, speaking to the undercover investigator about how easy it would be to get a license from the chief minister. I feel like no belongs to my family. Right. But um, um, my sisters, the four elder ones, are in the company. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the land and survey department. Okay. Yeah, they are the one that issues this license. Of course, it's from the CM's directive, but I can speak to the CM very easily. Can you? Yes. It's kind of hard to hear, but she's saying that her sisters are in the land and survey department and that she can easily speak to the chief minister, Abdul Taib Mahmoud. And do you think he will agree to it? Yeah. He was the one who gave us that land. Okay. Yeah. He's my cousin. So. His <laughs> family. Yeah. His mother and my father are sisters and brothers, siblings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, he's my first cousin. So it's quite easy. If you didn't catch that, she said that the chief minister will approve the licenses because he's her cousin. The global witness investigators were also put in touch with another lawyer, a man named Huang Lung Ong, to talk about a different potential land deal. He explains that if they were to purchase the land, they would need to personally pay off Chief Minister Abdul Taib Mahmoud. He explained how Taib would expect to receive a 10% personal payment for agreeing to the sale and providing the necessary permits. Behind that is the Chief Minister. Yes. Okay. And will he ever surface as a... As a... No. It's like, um, I award you this license. In return, you grateful to me, maybe you say I give you a percentage. Giving bribes to Taib in exchange for official permits appears to be standard practice. What we saw during our investigation was corroborated by several independent sources, including a high-ranking government official and a logging company executive. When Global Witness went back to Fatima Abdul Rahman about their undercover investigation, she never replied. We were also unable to reach her for comment. Huang Long Ong, the lawyer, stated that, quote, your allegations are untrue and not within my knowledge to answer. In a later interview with the Malay Mail, he said that he had been, quote, trapped by Global Witness and characterized what he said as coffee shop talk. And here's Abdul Taib Mahmoud denying that the investigation demonstrated he was in any way corrupt. I saw the, the, the so-called proof. Could it not be someone tried to promote themselves to become an agent? to get favors from me. It's nothing to do with me. Let's go back to Canada. In the 1970s, Abdul Taib Mahmoud sent three of his kids to Ottawa for high school. One of them was his daughter, Jamila. Here's investigative journalist Claire Rucastle brown again. It was fairly common practice for wealthy families, which by this time the Tibes clearly were in Malaysia, to look for foreign further education for their children. She attended Elmwood, one of the most prestigious schools in Ottawa's Tony Rockcliffe Park neighborhood. Jamila went on to study at Carleton University, and at the age of 23, she opened a real estate company called Sacto. The young Jamila Tibe was the public face of the company, and Sacto quickly began to acquire property in Ottawa. A few years later, in 1987, Jamila married a Rockcliffe Park native named Sean Murray. Sean came from a wealthy enough middle-class family, professionals, architects. Murray's father had even been the mayor of Rockcliffe Park before it was part of Ottawa. Murray joined Sacto and was soon acting as the head of the company. Sacto and various affiliated companies continued to grow. And Jamila and Sean expanded operations to the United States and Britain, though under different corporate structures. According to the Bruno Manser Fund, by the 2010s, Sacto owned more than $200 million of property in Ontario. And the other affiliated companies, Sacti in the United States and Ridgeford Properties in the UK, owned hundreds of millions more on top of that. Jamila Taib and Sean Murray became fixtures in the Ottawa social and philanthropic scenes, They were major donors to the Ottawa Food Bank and to military causes. They're involved with Ashbury College and the Elmwood School, and they've donated to both the Liberals and Conservative parties of Canada. They're also fixtures at Ottawa banquets and galas. 
And the reason I've spent so much time telling you about Malaysian politics is that Claire Rucastle Brown and the Bruno Manser Fund allege that Abdul Taib Mahmoud laundered his fortune into companies abroad, including SACTO. Now, I need to mention here that SACTO is currently suing the Bruno Manser Fund in Switzerland for alleged defamation. Those legal proceedings are ongoing. In any case, how does a woman straight out of college, the daughter of a public servant, start what would become a multi-million dollar company within months? And is there any evidence for these allegations? Well, let's run through what we know and what we don't know. As Claire Rucastle Brown began to investigate the finances of Abdul Taib Mahmoud and his family, it wasn't long before she came across a whistleblower. This was back in 2010. Well, I'm an old-fashioned journalist, and in my book, you know, the real information comes from insiders. Claire heard through the grapevine about a man named Ross Boyer, who lived in California. He had approached an environmental NGO, saying that he had information about the Tibes, and they ended up putting him in touch with Claire. Boyer had been a senior executive at SACTI, an American real estate company affiliated with SACTO. The company was set up by Own Mahmoud, Abdul Taib's brother, along with two of his sons, Abu Bekr and Suleiman Rahman. They set up SACT, which was also started to invest in tower blocks and office buildings and fancy um, residences in North America. Claire, along with Lucas Stroman, the head of the Bruno Manser Fund, went down to California to meet with Boyer to see what he had to say. As the guy who'd been running the company for the last 12 years, Ross was able to provide me with documentation and inside information. Ross Boyer had gotten into an employment dispute with Sakti. He sued for wrongful dismissal. The company also sued him and accused him of misappropriating funds and self-dealing. Neither of the lawsuits were completed. And Boyer told Claire and Lucas that as this dispute was happening, Boyer's life began to fall apart. Boyer claimed that the Tibes had hired a private detective to investigate him and to vilify him to his friends and acquaintances. And I know that because I, I took the trouble to go and speak to some of the contacts who confirmed that, um, you know, these private detectives hired by the Tibes had um, come and, and interviewed them and given them to understand that Ross was a corrupt person, which was obviously very damaging to him and his business. So. Ross was under the impression that this campaign was being extended to hacking, phone tapping, surveillance and intimidation. What I was able to establish was that it wasn't all in Ross's head. Claire says that she believes Boyer about this because a few years later, similar things happened to her. But we'll get to that later in the episode. When Ross Boyer and his wife met with Claire and Lucas in a bar at a Los Angeles hotel, he was clearly shaken. He said he was being followed. They soon went down to a meeting room in the hotel basement. And here's what he told the two of them. The following quotes attributed to Boyard appear in Lucas Stroman's book, Money Logging, on the trail of the Asian timber mafia. Quote, Tybe owns properties worth $80 million in San Francisco and Seattle. And I administered them for 12 years on behalf of his son, Suleiman. He then referred to three companies owned by Tybe family members, Sakti, Wally Sons, and W.A. Boylston. Quote, the companies are registered in the names of Tybe's children and his brothers and sisters, but in reality, they belong to him in person. Here's proof. Boyard then handed over documents, the most important of which was titled, Actions by Unanimous Written Consent of the Board of Directors of Sakti International Corporation. Now this document, was an issuance of a 1,000 new shares in the company. These shares were split amongst five different people. Two of them were Abdul Taib Mahmoud's brothers, and three of them were his children, Abu Bekr, Suleiman, and his daughter Jamila. Now here's the important part to pay attention to. The document stated that for four of those shareholders, everyone except Jamila, half of their shares were held in trust for Abdul Taib Mahmoud. What that meant was that it was the chief minister himself who owned those shares, but his name would never appear on any external paperwork or records. He was able to absolutely confirm that everyone looked to Taib Mahmood as the boss and that the children shareholders were really just front people 
in this organization. They were not the owners or the decision makers. He was the controller of the company over his children and brothers who were the, who were the front men, the front shareholders. Canada Land was not able to verify the authenticity of this shareholder agreement. We asked Sacto's lawyers for comment regarding this document, but they declined to respond to our specific questions. Claire Rucastle Brown reported the information that Ross Boyer provided her, though at the time she only referenced him as an anonymous source. As he was acting as a source for Claire, Boyer's mental health declined. He was placed in a psychiatric facility after a failed suicide attempt. In October of 2010, he was found dead in his hotel room. I was trying to reach out to him, trying to support him, trying to give the family, you know, courage and comradeship. But Ross was um, judged to have taken his own life. He did it in a a very unusual way. He managed, um, which is not easy, to suffocate himself by tying a plastic bag around his head. I never say what I can't prove. And I have no evidence that would contradict the official findings of the uh, coroner who ruled that he had committed suicide in the United States. So that's what I've always reported. It's a highly unusual and difficult way to kill yourself. One of the primary claims that Ross Boyer made before his death was that the day-to-day operations of Sakti and other property companies associated with the Taib family was being conducted by Sean Murray, Jamila Taib's husband, and an executive at Sakto, the Canadian real estate company. Sakto's lawyers declined to comment on this specific accusation. That whole North American and European property empire eventually gravitated from the directorship, management and control of the sons and brothers of Taib Mahmood to the son-in-law of Taib Mahmood, to Jamila's husband, the Canadian Sean Murray, is now the executive in charge of all these companies that have been brought together under his management in Canada. Claire Rucastle Brown and the Bruno Manser Fund have alleged that Sacto, the Canadian company, is also substantially owned by Abdul Taib Mahmood and that money from Sarawak that was acquired through corruption was used to finance the company. Do they have direct proof to substantiate these claims? In short, the answer is no. They blame Canada's opaque laws around corporate transparency. And it's true that compared to other countries like the United States and the United Kingdom, Members of the public are not entitled to very much information about private corporations in this country. And SACTO totally denies these accusations. Here's what we do know about SACTO. As we said earlier, SACTO was founded in 1983. In an interview to the Ottawa Citizen in 1989, Jamila Taib told them that the firm specializes in offshore investment in Canada and that her investors were absentee shareholders from Australia, Hong Kong, and Malaysia but she refused to name them. Today, we know that the original shareholders and directors of SACTO were all members of the Taib clan, Jamila and three other members of her family, including her uncle Own Mahmoud. So did any money from Abdul Taib Mahmoud end up in the company? Well, according to Abdul Taib Mahmoud himself, the answer is yes. Claire Rucastle Brown says that when she began to write about Jamila Taib's businesses in Canada, in questioning whether any of it was financed from her father in Malaysia, she began to receive legal threats. I had uh, one of London's largest law firms send me a voluminous and threatening letter, as they do, when I first started writing about Jamila's interests in Sarawak and in Canada. And they told me that Taib Mahmood had never injected any money whatsoever into Sacto, Sacti, Ridgeford. And if I implied that he had ever again, I would be dragged into, you know, vicious legal action against me. Well, you know, I ignored that and they decided not to um, act on their words. And and interestingly, uh, a few months later, Taib confessed in a PR interview in the run-up to the election because this had become such a hot election issue. He admitted that actually he had given his daughter money. He didn't specify how much. He sort of implied it was just trivial, you know, just a little bit to his college-age daughter who then turned into a complete genius um, in the development world and and the rest of it was all her own uh, money. But he admitted it. Here's that interview with Abdul Taib Mahmoud. I was resigning from 
federal government. I got gratuity. I put that okay on for her. I give some money to her. Start that new business. It thrive. It is a property development company. What Taib is saying above is that he provided his daughter some money that he received as a gratuity from his federal government job, and that she used that money to start SACTO. Now remember, according to the Bruno Manser Fund, in its first 10 years, SACTO was able to purchase more than $50 million in property. If this is accurate, then where did that money come from? In a 2017 report from the Bruno Manser Fund titled Safe Haven Canada, they analyzed the available public documents and determined that just over 50% of that came as loans from the company's shareholders, who were all members of the Taib family. None of the loans were paid back before 1993, the last year for which they had records. Now, CanadaLand has not independently verified these documents or that these transactions took place. In 1996, the Brunner Manser Fund claims that a $20 million mortgage loan was provided on a SACTO property. It was registered in trust for Jamila Taib. The lenders were four members of the Taib family, including Layla Taib, the wife of Chief Minister Abdul Taib Mahmoud. Another alleged lender was an offshore company owned by Own Mahmoud, Abdul Taib's brother. In 2013, the Sydney Morning Herald described Own Mahmoud as the second richest man in Malaysia surpassed only by his brother, the chief minister. On Mahmood was known as the businessman brother who was Taib's proxy, effectively, in Singapore and, you know, all over the globe. On was setting up companies for Taib. On Mahmood was one of the founding directors and shareholders of SACTO and SACTI. This is at least according to a letter allegedly sent by Sean Murray to the Toronto Star, parts of which were republished by the Brunner Manser Fund. We asked SACTO to confirm the authenticity of this letter, but they declined to respond to that question. We see SACTO being set up with three directors on, the only real adult there, and then Abu Bekir Mahmoud and uh, Jamila Taib, who um, were very young in their early 20s. In 2013, the Sydney Morning Herald published an investigation that stated that Own Mahmoud had avoided tens of millions of dollars in taxes in Australia over 20 years. They accused him of using, quote, an elaborate global financial network to export his earnings from a portfolio of Sydney commercial and residential properties worth an estimated $100 million. Own Mahmoud did not respond to the newspaper's requests for comment, and he was never charged by Australian authorities. We were also not able to reach him for comment. Claire Rucastle brown says that when it comes to the real estate companies associated with the Tybe family, it's clear what's happening. It's as plain as daylight what was going on, frankly. And I've said it several times, and despite all the threats, several years on, they have not sought to contradict me in a court of law. But I want to emphasize again that while I find a lot of these details very suggestive, none of it constitutes direct evidence that either Abdul Taib Mahmoud is directly involved in SACTO or that any illegal proceeds were siphoned into the company. We sent a number of questions to SACTO's lawyers. And here's some of what they had to say. Quote, SACTO, run by the Murrays, is a successful privately held property development and management company that has been doing business in Ottawa for over 30 years. It is 100% Canadian owned and has no business outside Canada. You have asked for comments and specific allegations, all of which appear to have been selected to give the false impression of wrongdoing. Please understand that a podcast is not the place for the victim of allegations of criminal behavior to respond. We have no reason to believe that your podcast has any intention other than to sensationalize a story and further victimize Sacto and the Murrays. Should you proceed with your podcast, which we strongly discourage, you must make it abundantly clear that the public interest requires that allegations of such behavior be reported to law enforcement who have the authority, independence, impartiality, and competence to properly investigate and assess the facts. You must also make it clear that every allegation you publish has been the subject of criminal complaints by your guests or close associates, all of which have been dismissed. In these circumstances, to continue to publish these allegations can only be characterized as harassment and defamation. Sacto's lawyers have asked us to mention that many of the allegations against the company have been reported to police services and other authorities in a variety of countries, but that no charges have come about as a result. 
Sacto has also created a website called thefactsmatter.ca, which purports to tell true facts about what they describe as a false campaign by the Bruno Manser Fund. And in 2017, the Bruno Manser Fund tried to use a legal mechanism called a Norwich Order to force Canadian financial institutions to release documents about Sacto. Essentially, they were asking the court to allow for a private prosecution, which is exceedingly rare. And in 2018, a judge denied them that, stating, quote, The applicant's story is a moving one that very naturally evokes sympathy. It is impossible to maintain indifference in the face of the possible destruction of the way of life of so many people and the loss of fragile, unique, and invaluable ecosystems in the forests of Sarawak. But, quote, the links between assets of the Sacto Group in Canada and the alleged corruption of Mr. Taib in Malaysia depend upon conjecture and suspicion more than evidence. We also attempted to reach Abdul Taib Mahmoud. We sent questions to his press secretary through Facebook, called his office, and attempted to reach him through his daughter, who is a member of the Malaysian parliament. We did not get a response. Claire Rucastle Brown says that she paid a price for her reporting on Sarawak and on Abdul Tai Mahmoud. In 2012, she says that she began to experience a harassment campaign similar to the one that Ross Boyer described. The New Yorker magazine alleged that Abdul Taib Mahmoud had hired infamous British PR firm Bell Pottinger to personally attack Claire and her reporting. According to The New Yorker, they created websites with false information, including false allegations of sexual impropriety by a colleague of hers. Bell Pottinger is now defunct after a scandal involving former South African President Jacob Zuma. But Claire says that that was just the beginning of the harassment campaign. She claims Taib also hired another British PR firm called FBC Media. What FBC Media were doing was making uh, very cheap programming for outfits like the BBC, CNBC, who should have known better. The BBC should have known not to commission a half-hour documentary from FBC Media for just one pound. But it was a, a wonderful, cheap way to get some programming done. You know, in fact, the money for that documentary was coming from the likes of Taib Mahmood. FBC Media's paid-for documentaries became a big scandal in Britain. Taib hired FBC Media largely to defame me for 15 million dollars. I saw the contract. Canada Land hasn't independently verified the contract, but Claire published details about it on the Sarawak report. I even had a horrible experience where my mobile phone was stolen from me while I was um, trying to get my act together in a lady's changing room in a swimming bath in London. And I, a few seconds later, realized my phone had gone. She tried to secure all of her personal information, but it was too late. I didn't manage to cancel things in time to prevent three days later all my emails being uploaded and then advertised in the same thai owned media in Sarawak. And then articles started appearing in thai owned newspapers making allegations that I'd said things in my various emails. Well, what those um, quotes were doing was... Um, uh, actually playing around with my emails, chopping emails together to make it seem like I'd said something I hadn't. And, and again, it was eminently disprovable. I had my original emails and I could show, you know, what, what they'd done to doctor and distort the emails. But, you know, all those dirty tricks, I mean, just legions of them. I was to experience myself, and this was sadly after Ross had, had taken his own life, having complained about similar dirty tricks. As one of my colleagues once said to me, you know, this is like living in a movie. Is this real life? It can't be happening. And it was ridiculous and totally counterproductive behavior. But people who become very rich without much acumen necessarily, because they have exploited and abused their positions rather than proven themselves particularly clever or useful at anything, you know, they seem to think that, you know, that they can get away with anything if they've got enough money to throw at it. And so, you know, up till now, I've largely been able to... Um, to pin down what they're doing, expose them and show them up. Abdul Taib Mahmoud stepped down as chief minister in 2014. 
he was immediately appointed as governor of Sarawak, becoming the ceremonial head of state. I was being told that that's, you know, it was our criticism that had made it too embarrassing for the central government to continue to support this man. He would have stayed in that job until he went out feet first, frankly, if we had not put all that pressure on him. While Claire still reports on Sarawak and Abdul Taib Mahmoud, over the last few years, she's been focused on another scandal. Starting in 2015, Claire helped uncover the 1MDB scandal, in which the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, was accused of siphoning off billions of dollars from the country's sovereign wealth fund. 1MDB has become one of the biggest scandals in modern Malaysian history, leading to the Prime Minister's resignation and eventually to his conviction for corruption. This led to a major political realignment in the country, as well as a number of anti-corruption initiatives. But Abdul Taib Mahmoud has still never been charged. Mutang Arud was finally able to return to his home of Sarawak a few years ago. And what he found was dispiriting. Nothing really has changed. Over all these years, of all the struggles we had, and the government really bent on destroying, bent on, on this so-called development project they have on, on our land. And the community have nothing to show for what has been taken. Of all the millions of dollars taken from the timber in their area, in our territory, what do they have to show for it? Nothing. He wishes there was more he could do. The only regret I have is the territory as the land is now being destroyed, continuing to be destroyed, continuing to be taken piece by piece by the, the, the state. I wish I am there. I wish I can pursue this on the ground, uh, but I can't because I'm in Canada, because I'm a citizen here in Canada. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, subscribe to this channel. And also consider subscribing to our main channel to find exclusive videos and behind the scenes content that you can't get anywhere else. And finally, we're an audience supported network. So if you care about the work that we do, become a supporter. You'll get access to new ad free episodes, discounts on our merch, tickets to live events, and so much more. Just go to canadaland.com slash join.